Welcome to The Dental Brief, the world's direct, right-to-the-point podcast produced to get you the information you need to learn and grow your practice. To learn more about our guests and find links to information discussed on our show, visit our website, dentalbrief.com. On to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. I have a awesome guest and speaker with us today. Uh, Sean, Mr. Crabtree, go ahead and say hello. Hello. How you doing, Patrick? I appreciate I'm, you having me on. Yeah, I'm I, ecstatic to have you here. So I'm doing fantastic. Um, Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your background. So just, yeah, really quick. I appreciate it, Patrick. Um, you know, my company is called the Crabtree Group. We are business strategists. It's just that, it's just that we happen to do that for dentistry. So what it is that we do is on the front end of working with a doctor and a team, we find out as much as we can about sort of who it is, how it is, what it is, and where it is that they want to be. We find out as much as we can about where they are in sort of, you know, each area and department in their practice. And then we help them develop strategies to get them from where they are to where it is that they want to go. We're very good at what we do, Patrick, if you can let me brag a minute. Um, you know, our guys on average will grow about 48%. It's not uncommon to have an office grow as much as 100%. That growth uh, usually happens in the first 12 to 14 months. And here's the key. Almost 100% of the time, that growth finds that these doctors and these, these teams are working less days and or less hours in the day than they did previously. So that's kind of what it is that we do. I've been doing this for the last 23 years, working closely with dentists and dental teams from Vancouver to Barbados, um, all over the Caribbean and all over the U.S., so let me ask you uh, specifically, how did you get, how did you start working with Dennis? How did you end up in this uh, niche? You know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting scenario and I won't bore you with the, with the, with the great details, but I started out in telecommunications. I'm an old guy, as you can tell, you know, these guys can't see me, but you can see the gray on my face. I'm an old guy. I started out in telecommunications when it was in its infancy. And one of my clients was a, uh, was with Tony Robbins, Anthony Robbins. And so, you know, long story short, he convinced me to jump ship from the telecommunications industry into dentistry, which I didn't really, you know, know anything about. Um, but as he was sort of courting me to jump into this industry, one of the things that I found, and, and really that leads into the topic that we're going to talk about today. One of the things that I found is the concept of just general business acumen uh, is non-existent in dentistry. You know, dentists spend an enormous amount of time, energy, effort, and money uh, becoming great clinically at what it is that they do, but they don't get the training and they don't get the necessary, um, you know, continuing education when it comes to the business aspects of their practice. Sure. And so, you know, that's the thing that attracted me to dentistry. And that's why I love it. And that's why I've been doing it for the last 23 years. That's awesome. Love it. Uh, it's amazing how many people end up um, in this niche, uh, specifically because of the voids that dentists have, um, that they're, they're able to fill from other industries. I love it. Um, let's jump right into a um, problem that you're here to help our, our audience solve today. Um, tell me about a problem that you see uh, often and one that I think a lot of dentists may not even know that they have. Um, but jump right in and talk, talk. Well, you know, the biggest challenge that I've seen in speaking at, you know, uh, dental uh, conventions all over the U.S. and outside of the U.S., whether it's uh, the midwinter or the Yankee or whatever, the number one question that I've been asked um, time and time again consistently is, Sean, how do I get more new patients? And 100 percent of the time, what we find is that. New patients, doctors, is not your biggest opportunity. Um, I can't tell you how many stories I have over the years. I've got a book coming out here, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, maybe the first of next year, um, really about this subject matter specifically. And, you know, I tell a story in the book about a doctor who reached out to me. Um, I don't know the, 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 if you know the numbers. In the, in the U.S., a median general dental practice uh, you know, we'll do somewhere around $675,000 a year. <clears throat> I had a doctor, which is, this is a typical example. I had a doctor reach out to me. 
he was doing about 1.5 million a year, which by all accounts is above, you know, the, the average in the U S sure. And his first question was, man, how in the world do I get more new patients? I've got to grow this thing. And so I'm asking him questions, you know, you're doing $1.5 million a year. So how many new patients do you see in a month? He said 90. He's seeing 90 new patients a month. Now to put that into perspective, and again, this is a challenge that I see across the board. This doctor, although he's doing $1.5 million a year, he's struggling. You know, he's got a razor thin profitability and some months he's not even able to pay himself. As I dived into it, if you, you know, he's got 90 new patients a month, plus the patients that he's already seen in hygiene, plus the patients that he's taking care of on the operative side. He had 19, uh, 19 team members, including all of the part time people that he had just to be able to keep up with the sheer numbers of patients that he's running through the practice. Right. Overhead, you know, of course, is out of control. Um, and again, he's not able to pay himself and he's always worried about being able to make payroll and those kinds of things. So again, the issue is not more new patients. And I see doctors struggling who have been in practice for years, you know, constantly seeking out massive amounts of new patients to be able to keep the ball rolling when in effect, the challenge is, and this is what we find, they've got about a 19% acceptance rate. Now, what does that mean? That means that about 81% of everything that they are presenting to their patients is not being accepted, but it doesn't stop there. When you've got a 19% acceptance rate, it affects your mindset. And, and some of your listeners will know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, you, 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 when you consistently get turned down with treatment, then you get shy and a little bit scared and skittish about what it is that you're going to present. And so it's not as simple as you got a 19% treatment acceptance rate. It also affects what you're presenting over time. Right. And so instead of presenting in the comprehensive case, you know, they're presenting the, the SRP or the first step or whatever the situation is. So that 19% represents only 19% of what's being presented. This is a massive, massive, massive opportunity. And it's one of the things, in addition to the many things that we work with our clients on, it's one of the things that makes a massive impact. When you can take a practice that's, you know, seeing 90 new patients a month and trying to make 1.5 million, you reduce that to, like, I've got a practice in a, a very economically depressed part of the country. These guys are seeing about 42, 43 new patients a month. They're doing $2.8 million, you know, single doctor practice with a specialist. And specialist does very little when you when you can take your practice and have it much more efficient in that way. It's not only that you're reducing your overhead, you're reducing your stress because you don't have as many patients to see. The other side of the coin is you're making life changers for your patients. You're making a difference when you're presenting comprehensive treatment plans and the patients are accepting what it is that they want or they need. You're actually changing lives. And at the end of the day. I mean, isn't that isn't that why you're in dentistry to begin with? Yeah, of course. So let's talk about this. Uh, let's kind of dive deeper in, into uh, something that you said. You, you mentioned that uh, they're basically the rejection of the case, right? You said it a little uh, more elegantly than that, but the rejection of the case actually causes the dentist to want to present less, right? Or tiptoe around presentations. Uh, skittish is a good word. Yeah. yeah, skittish is a great word. So. I think what oftentimes happens is a patient acts a certain way so many times and then the dentist actually starts to think for the patient, right? Starts to try to guess what the patient's going to say yes to or what they're going to say no to. Do you see that? You know, I, I see that. I see the, 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 exactly what you're talking about. I see it manifest itself in so many different ways. You know, it's interesting to point out as a side note, this is not specifically a dentistry specific challenge either. Of this course. is across the board in every business, right? Yep. Um, but I do see what you're saying manifest itself in a lot of different ways. You know, I've had doctors uh, in the past in conversations tell me that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very conservative in my um in my diagnosis or I'm very aggressive or so-and-so down the street is very conservative or they're very aggressive and all of that. And I think that is really an illustration of what you're talking about. At the end of the day, 
as the doctor, the professional who's making the diagnosis. It's not about being aggressive. It's not about being conservative. It's about finding out what it is that's most important to the patient and then giving them a diagnosis that gets them what it is that they want. That diagnosis is neither conservative nor aggressive. It's taking yourself as a doctor out of this and finding out what is really best for your patient. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on my next question. Uh, I'll let people refer to you and contact you because I'm sure you can have a little more detail. But You're how do giving you find me a heads up that I need to reel it back a little, right? Because I, I can talk too much. Well, no, you're not talking too much at all. Um, but I just want to – I don't want people to um, – you know, there's a lot of things that people can do on their own right away, and I get that, and we always want that to happen. Um, in this this particular question, how do you know? How do you know if your case acceptance is acceptable, if you have an issue, if you don't? What are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to yourself? Are you comparing it to the rumors that you hear or other doctors bragging? Which, by the way, when you talk about, you know, the amount of new patients, there's always this. Uh, every dentist always tells me, oh, I want to see 50 to 60 new patients per month. I don't know where that number comes from um, and what it means, right? Do you want to see 50 to 60 ex- new patients that are all extractions? No problem, right? Is that really what you want? Or is there more to this equation than just that simple number of 50 to 60? So so tell me, how, how can they find out uh, if they have a problem with their case acceptance, if it's good, if it's bad, what it looks like? Tell me. So, so I'll try to answer this uh, with brevity in mind. Um, you know, the, the only way that you can know how, you, how well you're doing is to track it. Uh, I've learned over the years that, you know, honest to goodness, about 90% of the offices do not track treatment acceptance. And the 10% that do are not tracking it properly. Um, there's a lot of bad information out there, too. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's there's some there's some dental specific social media sites that will tell you that a 30 percent treatment acceptance rate is awesome. And you could never even hope to get more than 30 percent. Uh, I can tell you that my guys shoot for a 98 percent treatment acceptance rate, and that's comprehensive diagnosis and comprehensively accepted and accepted is paid for at the time of scheduling. Now, if we're talking about insurance, it doesn't mean that they, you know, I mean, insurance is part of that payment, but there's a financial commitment at the time of scheduling. And frankly, if there's no financial commitment that is not accepted, uh, you know, you can't consider it accepted until, you know, scheduled doesn't mean accepted, right? Sure. Committed to financially means accepted. So what is a what is a good, you know, rate that you can be shooting for? Um, I'm telling you, you ought to be shooting for above 90 percent. Wow. And, and the reason I say that is because your overhead is tied to your ability to see the patients. Right. It's you know, the work that you're doing is what your overhead is tied to. So um, just just seeing the patients doesn't mean that you're being effective. Seeing the patients doesn't mean that the acceptance is actually working. So to be able to affect that number, you got to get the acceptance really up. Got it. So go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. No, I was just going to say a quick way to track it is, you know, there's a million ways to do it. But the quickest way to do it is track seriously every single patient, every single day, how much was diagnosed and how much was accepted with some sort of financial commitment. Every single patient, every single day. I don't know what that sounds like if you're not, if you're hearing this for the first time and you're not used to doing that, but I can tell you that there's no shortcut when it comes to that. And, you know, again, spending dollars on marketing, constantly searching for new patients is not helping your bottom line when you've got literally, you know, if you're listening to this and you've been in practice more than a couple of years, you know, you've got a million dollars sitting out there in unfinished and unaccepted work. It is just sitting there. Right. And, and continuing to add to that rather than addressing the issue is not supporting it. Got it. Uh, Let's, let's kind of switch gears just a little bit here. Um, Give the audience a couple of actionable steps, right? Tracking is one. We know that, but give them a couple of actionable steps. What can they do right now today, this next 15 minutes, this next hours, this next 12 hours, to, to start improving their case acceptance? You know, step number one, I would say, is change your mindset. Um, get past past experiences, get past, uh, you know, what you've viewed in the past and understand that your patients, just like you and I in different industries, your patients are lay people. They don't understand what's going on in their mouth. You've got to understand that 
I think the ADA came out with a stat recently or, or a couple of years ago that said basically, I think 79% of all the needed mm-hmm. dentistry in the U.S. is not felt by the patient. In other words, 79% of the dentistry that's needed in the U.S. <clears throat> doesn't hurt the patient. So they don't walk in the door if they're not in pain, realizing what they need. So step one is find out what is it that is most important to this patient from an emotional standpoint? That's the key. You and I and your patients don't buy based on cost. We buy based on what we see a value in and value is emotional and it's individual. So before you get into a diagnosis, dive in and find out emotionally, what is it that's most important to this patient? So then on the back end, you can show them how whatever they need clinically is going to get them what it is that they want emotionally. Brilliant. Sean, help us figure out how to vet someone. There's a lot of there's a lot of people that are in and around this industry that kind of dabble working, consulting with practices, uh, trying to help practices. How do you vet an expert? How do you find someone who can help you with this uh, problem? You know, I, at, at the risk of, uh, of, of, uh, of sounding negatively, I, I got to tell you, the concept of influence and acceptance. And by the way, that's what it, that's what acceptance is, is influence. That concept is a business concept. And so step one, I would find somebody who understands the concept from a business standpoint. Uh, you know, if you if you're if you're looking for somebody specifically because you have a heart condition, you know, you're probably not going to go to an oral surgeon. Uh, same way here. If you're looking to take your treatment acceptance to the next level, you want to get somebody who's got experience in general business, specifically sales. Sure. It's great advice. Sean, appreciate you coming on the show. Um, website one more time, the crabtree group.com. Uh, folks, there's a ton of information on Sean's website uh, and his company's website. I highly recommend that you go there. Um, you'll find so much um, that'll help get you in the right direction. I uh, reach out yeah. to Sean, give him a call. Sean, I'll give you the last few words. Thanks for coming on. Well, I was going to say thank you for having me, Patrick. I appreciate it very much. And I hope, you're, hope your listeners find value and what it is that we talked about. And anybody can reach out to us. We're happy to help, however that looks. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. Did you know you can weigh in on today's topic on Facebook? Search The Dental Brief on Facebook or visit our website, dentalbrief.com, and just follow the link. We look forward to having you join us again on another episode of The Dental Brief.